Good afternoon, and welcome to our New York Archives Magazine online speaker series. I'm Josie Madison, editor of New York Archives. Today, we're joined by James Odato for our program, Researching and Writing About the Life of Disability Rights Activist, Lucy Gwynn. James M. Odato, a journalist for four decades, has been a staff reporter for several New York newspapers, including spending 18 years at the Albany Times Union. His stories have appeared in national and international newspapers, and his award-winning investigations have led to policy changes in New York. A freelance writer, he teaches journalism and lectures on the power of public repositories and archives. He lives in Schenectady, New York. Tom Ruller has been New York State Archivist since 2015. Tom is the author of several peer-reviewed journal articles and reviews on the use of technology in archives and the preservation of records in electronic form, on which subjects he has consulted with several state governments and other organizations. And a bit of housekeeping, there will be a question and answer section session at the end of the presentation. So feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And at the end, we'll leave a few minutes and try to get to as many of those as we can. And without further ado, I am pleased to introduce James and Tom. Thank Thanks, you very Josie. much, Josie. Jim, it's, it, this is a great pleasure for me personally as, as an archivist, because someone, A, who understands what we do and how we do it is uh, a great opportunity to spend some time with, uh, with you for that, but also someone who has made really good use of the records that archivists preserve to tell a story that really hasn't been told very well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I personally am very grateful for this opportunity to talk to you and the work that you have done. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. I, I have a great regard for archivists. I have a great regard for biography, and I have a great regard for history. Biographers and historians, uh, my hat is off to the work they do because uh, I, I have been a mainstream journalist for a long time now. And uh, what I have, and what you probably are aware of, is that it is difficult enough to report the truth of today, right? There's so much misinformation and disinformation out there. Um, what archivists do is help historians and biographers be investigative reporters of the past about things that happened years ago, decades ago, centuries ago and to get the get at the truth of what happened with people who haven't been around on this planet for a hundred years or more what what these biographers and historians do is just amazing and they couldn't do it without what you folks are providing um primary source records and uh, they are so vital to, to research of all kinds. So I, I say thank you. Um, if you have any questions for me, go, go ahead and fire away. But uh, I got a I'll, I'll, just start, I'll just start with that. OK. Well, we're going to talk today uh, about your book, about Lucy Gwynn. And uh, so maybe before we get too far, um, maybe you could tell us uh, a little bit about Lucy Gwynn, set some context for us, and maybe tell us uh, what drew you to her story? And, and you have some PowerPoints. Would, would you like me to bring those up uh, now? Yeah. yeah, why don't you? That'd be fine. Okay. Um, but to answer your question while you're trying to figure out the technology <laughs> is, uh, is uh, I, um, I didn't know who Lucy Gwynn was before um, June of 2018. Um, I, like a lot of people, um, didn't know a great deal about the, the disability rights movement. And what I did know a lot about was uh, reporting and journalism. And one of the things I, I, I have been doing um, since I left full-time journalism is uh, instructing at the University at Albany in the journalism program. And I speak with, uh, I work with students who are journalism majors, 
who are uh, upper class journalism majors, um, juniors, seniors, uh, people who want to get into the business or at least want to know the tools of the business. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things I have been building into my syllabus, Tom, is a, a visit to the U Albany archives. The U Albany archives are located on the third floor of the Science Library building. Uh, I love going to the U, U Albany archives. I love going with my students to the, the U Albany archives. I find that even though these students are juniors and seniors, they've been walking around this campus for four years, have never stepped foot into the U Albany archives. But once they get in there, they are greeted by a woman named Jody Boyle, who uh, is a, an archivist there with incredible enthusiasm. And uh, I introduced students to the world of the archives, the files there, the potential stories waiting for them to research, the potential documents that could augment stories they're working on. Um, and I have witnessed uh, the excitement that exists, uh, that, that comes through when some of these students suddenly find something, they hit upon something in one of these files that motivates them to do more archival, archival research. Um, in um, 2018, my, my class ended in May of 2018. And I um, decided to do something that essentially is walking the walk. I talk and I tell my students all the things they need to do to find stories and research good stories. I personally wanted to do a long form narrative uh, journalism project for myself. And uh, I decided that I would go on a hunt to archives. I pretty much knew what the U Albany archives offered. I knew what the Union College archive offered. I had a little smidging of understanding it of the uh, archives that were available within a half hour drive from my house. But I thought maybe if I uh, pushed the, the, the boundary a little bit and figured out what was available to me within a couple of hours from my home. That's why when, when, uh, Joyce, uh, when um, Jody, uh, Josie introduced me and indicated I live in Schenectady, uh, east, south, north and west from Schenectady, there are some incredible archives waiting to be perused. And I went on a hunt. Um, you can start your hunt by going on the finding aids that these wonderful archives have, including the New York State Archive. Um, and they tell you abstracts of the material that exists there, waiting for someone to took, take a look at. And I went to a number of universities. I went to some colleges. Uh, I saw some pretty good, uh, some from pretty good possibilities. But waiting for me on the 25th floor of the, what was the, it may still be the tallest library in North America at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst uh, was a, a file of, with six boxes and it was the Lucy Gwynn file. And I sat down with that file <clears throat> and I started reading through it. And uh, it dawned on me that I had found a subject worthy of a long form narrative um, nonfiction piece. And uh, I, I started perusing it. Um, and I went back to that file. I took the trip to Amherst a few, several times to look at, at that file, read every copy of Mouth Magazine, which Lucy Gwynn produced uh, for 18 years, starting in July of 1990 in Rochester, New York. And, uh, got to see her records, her journals, her song lyrics, her poetry, her manuscripts, her personal, um, in some cases, medical records. And they were all important because it told the story of Lucy Gwynn. It gave me the backbone for what I wanted, to, uh, what, what ended up being her biography. This brain had a mouth, Lucy Gwynn, in the voice of disability nation. The backbone of it still required a lot of work, 
just like I tell my students, documents are, are great. They're absolutely vital. Um, but you have to interview these documents and you have to interview real people too. But I learned that Lucy Gwynn and the, and the records at UMass supported this was the um, victim of a serious head injury in the summer of, uh, of let's see, 1989. And it, it was the turning point in her life because on, at that point she became uh, someone who needed to survive a traumatic brain injury. Before then, her previous 46 years on the planet, she had done a lot of things, a lot of very interesting things, which were documented, some of them, in, in, the, in, in the use in the uh, archive. But from that moment when she suffered the head injury, she became a, a member of Disability Nation. And she used that experience and the anger that came from that and, and the, the, the knowledge of being a member of that nation um, to become a, a disability rights activist and to become a advocacy journalist. And uh, Mouth Magazine is um, something, like I said, she, re she ran it for 18 years until 2008 about six years before she died. And uh, it, it was an a, amazing piece of advocacy journalism. If, if you ever wanted to teach or learn how to perform advocacy journalism, um, Mouth Magazine would be a good uh, publication to study. So anyway, I learned about Lucy Gwynn and her life and who she was by sitting down in front of six boxes on the 25th floor of the University of Massachusetts Library. And the reason I did that, the reason I was able to do that is because of an archivist in Amherst, Massachusetts knew that someday someone would be interested in those materials. That archivist in, New, in Amherst, Massachusetts, not in Rochester, New York, um, decided to drive his Subaru nine hours to Washington, Pennsylvania, where Lucy lived and died um, at age 71 and, and get collect her records just a few months before she passed away hmm. and brought them back and, and, and some, are, some of his people sorted it and labeled it and put it in order. And I wouldn't be surprised if I was the only one that's ever entered that record. Hmm. Um, it was waiting for me. And I can get into a long, boring lecture to you about walking through doors uh, and, and using um, cliches and hackneyed uh, phrases about the importance of walking through doors. But I walked through that door at, at, on the 25th floor of the UMass archive and it opened uh, a world to me that I didn't know before because I had to start to study. I, 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 Tom, I, I think I told you this before when we, we were chatting. Um, you, you or all of our listeners, um, if you got, got into a car right now and drove to your local mall, right? And asked a um, hundred people, uh, to name a leader in the suffrage, women's suffrage movement, the, um, uh, you name the movement, gay rights, civil rights, um, anti-war, anti-Vietnam War movement, abolition movement. Out of 100 people, you would get some names. There would be some Harriet Tubman's and John Brown's and, and uh, Susan B. Anthony's, and, and there better be 99 MLKs, uh, or otherwise you get you got to get back in the car and drive away. But how many people 
if you walked up to 100 people at the, at the local mall and said, give me the name of someone from the disability rights movement, one person. I, had a, I didn't know much about disability, disability rights when I started this project. Um, I, I had to re read up on it. I had to talk to a lot of people. I had to learn who the players were before the ADA was created and after the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a project, it was a learning project. Um, and thanks to Lucy Gwynn, thanks to an archivist, thanks to a finding aid, um, thanks to my students, uh, I, I found a, a subject worthy of a biography. Well, Lucy was a fascinating person. She, she had this whole life before her TBI, her traumatic brain injury. Sure. And you know a lot of, uh, and I think you, you talk about, you know she was a, a PR person, really, a marketing person. And to some extent, it seems like her, her skill set in knowing how to help people understand something, to sell something, yeah. really enabled her to raise the visibility of, of the disabled and raise the, raise the bar for everyone to know this is what we need to do to provide adequate rights and adequate protections for, for these folks. And like you say, yeah. this was before the Americans with Disabilities Act. Right. Uh, and, and so she was really a, a pioneer, but she brought with her critical skills to enable her to be that pioneer. Yeah, perhaps you can go to the next slide, Tom. Sure. Um, this is me in the, in the archives. Um, and you can see the box of records in the background. Uh, any, any archivist, um, would recognize that scene. You know, those wonderful lawyer boxes, those legal boxes full of documents waiting for someone to take a look at. It's me listening to tape of, of Lucy Gwynn because uh, there was a, uh, a fellow who did a, um, a number of interviews for oral histories of disability rights leaders. Hmm. I li and I got one of the leaders he interviewed was Lucy Gwynn. So I got to listen to her voice um, in the archives too. That, that was up in UMass and, and a lot of other voices of people who no longer are walking the planet. Um, so they are vital records. You never know what's, what's available in, in an archive. This was, these were additional materials outside the box. Um, okay, you can go to the next one, please. Okay, this is the kind of material you would see. These are her notes, right? Okay, so what I, what you, what I learned uh, what, from the archive, if you can go to the next one too, please. Okay, this was, uh, the reason I asked you to do this is because my, I, I lead the book with this particular quote. This is, a, this is Lucy's handiwork. This is a personal ad that she, uh, she placed in, in, in um, an alternative weekly newspaper in Rochester in the 80s. Uh, it's called City Newspaper. And, and it's an ad, uh, it's a blind ad. It's a woman who's depicting herself as someone who's got a very interesting, fascinating history, looking for a one of a, one of a kind man, she, she's looking for dates, okay? This is an ad, personal ad. Now, as you, you indicated before, Tom, um, Lucy had a, a life before disability rights, before advocacy journalism, and she was an advertising professional. She knew how to package, she knew how to write uh, copy that people would recognize and think about and maybe even buy the product that she was uh, hired to advertise or, or, or write copy for. She worked in Chicago for one of the biggest advertising uh, companies in, in, in the country um, and was very successful at getting people to think about buying brand flakes and toothpaste. and. Um, all kinds of products, um, but at age 30, I mean, she could have she could have done that for an entire career uh, and and six figure paychecks 
uh, annually um, and had a very wealthy, comfortable life. At age 30, she decided she didn't want to do that anymore. Um, and that was 1973. She moved to Rochester uh, with a lot of other people, a lot of other friends. And Rochester drew her and a lot of other people. This is another thing I learned about Rochester I didn't know because of a Zen center there. There were two big, and there still is, I believe, two big Zen centers huh. in the United States. One is out in California, and the other one is in upstate New York on Lake Ontario um, in a city that once was bustling. And Lucy moved there with her friends. They all got jobs because there were jobs galore there. Lucy uh, created a, a restaurant there. And so she became a restaurateur. Um, she got, after five years of doing that, she decided she wanted to become she wanted, she got adventurous um, and she uh, took a job as a deckhand on these huge boats that serviced the oil rigs off the coast of Louisiana. And she did that work for a year. Uh, a woman in a male dominated industry uh, and she encountered all kinds of uh, sexual harassment, assault, uh, colorful people and she wrote a book about it. She wrote a memoir it's called Going Overboard. Um, this is a woman in her early 30s writing her first book. Never went to college, right? She reads, writes a manuscript, a memoir about her one year experience uh, working on as a deckhand. And Viking Press gets the manuscript and says, yeah, We'll publish this. I mean, think about that. Think about all the writers out there who, yeah. with the rejection letters. It, Viking Press. It's nothing to sneeze at. Yeah. So I'm talking about, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm, the reason I bring this up is because I was looking at her work, um, her manuscripts, her writing, her poetry, uh, her work in Mouth Magazine. I'm reading this. Look it, I've been working at, for newspapers and I've seen lots of stories in my life. I've seen written lots of stories in my life. I'm looking at this woman's work and I'm saying, this is a really effective writer. Uh, she knew how to, and like I said, she knew how to package things. She knew how to distill, um, put a lot of potent sentences together. And that impressed me. So, uh, like I said, I, I, I went on a, a hunt to become uh, an expert on who she was. Um, and it all started with the archives, with that back, the backbone of the story. If you would go to the next slide, please. This is a copy of what Mouth Magazine is. This was a 1992 copy. This is almost exactly two years after she debuted the, uh, the magazine. It was known for the first few years as this brain has a mouth. That's where the title comes from. <coughs> this brain had a mouth is about Lucy Gwynn and about this magazine. This is a, the way she packaged it. This is one, this is one issue out of over a hundred. But look at that, Lady Liberty in a, in a wheelchair, okay? Now, um, she was focused on um, a lot of things. I mean, Lu Lucy Gwynn would have been a story if, a, a very interesting story, if you just wrote about her up to the point of the accident that changed her life when she was going out on a blind date right mm -hmm. um, in Rochester, New York. And she got rushed to the hospital, General Hospital in Rochester. She was there for three weeks or so. She was not, be she was not behaving particularly good. Um, they decided that she had traumatic brain injury. They moved her to a, a rehab facility in Cortland, New York, run by one of the biggest rehab uh, center chains in, in the United States. And she 
realized that she had lost her, her independence. Um, she had no longer had any agency over the care she received um, or her body. Uh, she was infuriated. She did not like being a member of Disability Nation. This, is a, this was a, a blow to her independence. And she, if, if, among all her characteristics, independence is probably her greatest one. Uh, she gets a, a boyfriend to come get her and break her out. out of, after three weeks of this rehab facility, she goes back to Rochester, New York, an angry person. And she's angry at this rehab facility that she believes has been doing nothing but milk the insurance companies, her insurance company and everybody else's, um, of uh, hundreds of dollars a day thousands a week. And she goes after them. She uses her anger to contact government um, agencies, public um, elected officials, uh, investigatory agencies to do something about this. And you know what? Um, it takes a time for the bureaucracy to catch up. But while this is happening, she decides to to take her anger and put it into a publication. And she starts packaging stories together in this publication. Stories about what it's like to be brain injured from first person accounts and stories about the industry. Um, and uh, over time, things change. Um, one thing that happened was the FBI investigated the chain that she was complaining about. She was very um, much, act, very active with the FBI investigation, let me put it that way. She got Congress to investigate. She helped get motivate Congress to investigate the brain injury rehab industry. And there were hearings in Washington that she testified at. Um, and New Medico broke up. Um, New Medico being the chain that she was particularly concerned with. Uh, they were never charged with any wrongdoing, but they were investigated heavily. Um, the, Lucy, the, I'm sorry, Jim. Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah, and Lu Lucy's uh, magazine, because she was like me, she did not know a lot about the disability rights movement. She learned it on the fly from the moment she got back to Rochester until the moment she died, she had become a student, an activist, an agitator, an organizer, every aspect of the disability rights movement she was part of, and she was an advocacy journalist. But she dropped the name of her magazine from this brain had a mouth or has a mouth to mouth because she became more inclusive. Uh, she, the magazine evolved. Uh, it, it, it started running color on the cover instead of black and white and including all kinds of people from the disability community, not just people like herself who were um, survivors of, of traumatic brain injury. So Mouth Magazine um, was and became and developed into a key voice for the community. And this is, this is something it's happening in, at a time when there's no internet, there's no social media. It's tough for people to connect. There are people all over this country and beyond who this magazine appealed to and get, it got sent all over the place and passed along at Centers for Independent Living. And, uh, and, and in, in fact, my understanding is that uh, the White House had a subscription. So, um, it, she, she became one of those people you might name if you knew about the disability rights movement. Uh, and um, she interacted with all, the, all of the people who were alive during her life, lifetime, who were the leaders of the movement. Yeah. Mouth Magazine is a fascinating window into so many things. It's... Um, 
I was able to look at a few of, of the issues and Lucy's anger comes through or just her sort of, I don't want to say anger, but her radical approach, almost mm -hmm. no holds barred yep. in some of the, the, the language in the magazine. But it features, as you said, the st first person narratives of people who are in the movement. And in, in later issues, it, I, I, I really like the subtitle. It is the voice of Disability Nation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I thought that was, was great. Mm -hmm. I struggled to find a complete set. It looks like the only complete record of uh, Mouth is at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Are there other places where you think there might be a complete set of Mouth? They might be in Schenectady, New York. <laughs> I, 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 um, well, Tom, is, is, I, I hope there are, are some repositories of complete sets. Um, but UMass has got the set, the, the complete set. I have, I think I'm missing two or three from the early years. Um, but I have read every edition and I own almost every edition. And the reason I own most of most every edition is because I didn't stop my um, my research um, at UMass. I I went to uh, Rochester and spent a fair amount of time there. And by the way, way the Rochester historian Christine Radarsky has been very helpful to me. Um, I uh, spent some time in in uh, Topeka, Kansas, where um, hmm. Lucy moved after living in Rochester for an awful long time. And, uh, and I spent some time in, in Washington, Pennsylvania, where it was her final uh, destination. Um, and I spent some time in Washington, DC with people, people who, who knew Lucy there. And wherever I stopped, I picked up copies of, of Mouth Magazine. Um, the executor, executress of her estate had boxes of materials that um, the brilliant archivist at the University of Massachusetts, Rob Cox, did not bring back to, to, to Amherst. Hmm. Um, he, he, he brought back a lot of excellent stuff, but I, he left behind some absolutely important material that um, augmented the biography quite a bit and gave me more in, uh, insights into the woman I was trying to write about. Um, so you were able to get at that additional stuff? Oh yeah, I, I was I was granted uh, access to a warehouse which and a, a good portion of that warehouse was Lucy Gwynn material. Her books, her mm -hmm. um, there were journals, there were manuscripts of things that didn't exist at UMass. Uh, uh, her, her laptop, her, her desktop computer, um, all kinds of very interesting stuff that added to my knowledge. Um, look at, I didn't, I was not short of material. Uh, I had, and, and I had plenty of material um, to tell, to let Lucy tell her story. Um, I collected her words, uh, her written words and the words she left behind uh, on tapes and in interviews and in conversations with other people. I interviewed a, about 130 people who knew her. Um, so not everyone's quoted in the, in the book. Not all the material I collected was used for the, for, the, for, the, for the narrative. Because one of the things that I was concerned about, Tom, is um, I'm, I'm, tr I'm very respectful to the reader. Um, and one of the things I learned from, from teaching students in particular is I learned a lot from my students. And I learned that not every student and every person will read what you ask them to read, even if there's a grade involved, right? <laughs> so I know that um, a lot of people are not gonna read a 600 page biography. And there are, are 1,000 word biographies out there that I could read. I could read. Uh, I started studying biography and how to um, produce a, a book that might be read. 
including by uh, undergrads. Um, and I wanted to write something that was a narrative nonfiction piece that had uh, a, a tempo, that had a, a, a beat. Um, I did not want to write the uh, encyclopedia version of the disability rights movement, but I wanted to sprinkle and uh, have a drum beat in the background of this book. I wanted to sprinkle information about the movement, moments in the movement that were important, people in the movement who were important, um, without slowing down the pace of the narrative. Mm -hmm. and so I, what my goal was, was to write a, a accessible book, a biography of a woman who lived 71 years. Now, if you live 71 years, you live 61 years or 51 years. There are a lot of moments in your life. Um, so what I tried to do was capture the, the important moments and um, document and chronicle the important moments of her life and somehow interweave some of the important moments of the disability rights movement. Um, both at the same time, so that I was being sneaky almost. I was trying to use her as a face to get people to recognize that there was a, a movement, there is still a movement uh, going on um, that they should know about. Because there's a, we started this conversation talking about history. And there is a hole in American history taught to students, as far as I'm concerned, relative to the disability rights movement. Um, there are a lot of holes um, in our education system. Um, and I thought maybe this, this uh, biography might help. It, not, it was not gonna fill a hole, but it, you can, the people and the, the in instances and the things I cite in the book are easily um, Googled, you know? You name somebody. I'd like to know more about that person. Um, they're out there. And the thing is, what isn't out there is a lot of books, um, biographies, uh, and memoirs of, uh, involving people from the disability rights movement. And I, I'm a mainstream journalist, Tom. And one of the things that, that, that um, mainstream media does a good job of is covering movements. Um, there are a lot of movements going on right now that are front page news and they deserve to be. But I'm not so sure how well I did and we did, have done covering this particular movement. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think it's, you know, I looked at it and I, I'm thinking to myself, <coughs> um, this is a woman with a good story. She's an interesting person. And this could be a book. And uh, I, when I started interviewing people, um, I started, one of the things I would do, I was cold calling people. And people had, who hadn't talked to Lucy Gwynn for 25 years. And they, you know, you, I cold call people. A lot of people don't, don't like cold calling. They like interview, they like introductions or, um, I don't know, email or letters in, in, in advance. I was just calling people cold. I said, hey, look at I'm my name's Jim Odato. I'm working on uh, some information. I'm working on a book or uh, a piece. Actually, I said, I was working on a piece about a woman named Lucy Gwynn. And I could tell I had them immediately. <laughs> And some of these people were delighted to relive the moments in a 60 minute, 90 minute, three hour conversation. Um, and uh, at the end of these interviews, I would say to these people, you know, um, do you think that she would be a good subject for a biography? And universally, uh, the answer was yes. Uh, one in one occasion, the guy who sprung her from the rehab facility, I got a, yeah, the ex-boyfriend, I got a hold of him, and he hadn't seen her and talked to her since 
roughly around 1992. And uh, he said, are you kidding me? She, she'd be a good subject for a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I think he might be right. So, uh, yeah. I, I, I liked your analogy about these holes. Uh, ensuring that archives collect and make available materials from communi communities and movements that aren't adequately represented in the documentary record yeah. is a priority for archivists um, across the, the entire country, really across the entire world. Sitting, wow. knowing what you know, and having had the experience that you've had, what would you advise archivists to do to increase both the accessibility of collections? You know, how do I find these things? But yeah. also, uh, you know, like, how do you find Gwyn stuff without knowing her name? Um, as well as identify the kinds of records and materials that we should be bringing into archives to help fill those holes and to give the raw material to biographers and historians in the future. So that the, you know, these other, these movements have the raw material to have their stories told. What should we be doing? Yeah, well, you know, I think that one of the things that, that, that happens, I think, I don't know if it's organically or not, but um, when it, you're, you're, are you talking specifically about the disability rights movement? Or are you talking about the bigger? Uh, I'll, whatever question you want to answer, Jim. Okay. <laughs> well, well here, here's the thing that I have learned from um, perusing archives is that, and it's a really cool thing, and it makes totally a total sense, is that an archive will get, um, a lot of times it's the director of the, the director of the archive can have a big um, role in this. A lot of times, just like the uh, editor of a magazine or publisher of a magazine or a, or a newspaper for that matter, can have a big role in, in the priorities um, that are the, the leadership that they, that, that they direct. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that the UMass Archive has a, an interest in social justice movements. So as a result, they go looking for material that augments their ability to collect a, a critical mass of stuff on this issue or this, this theme. Um, and um, and as a re after a while, people, you know, um, researchers, scholars who go to a certain archive because it is known to have a, a critical mass of that kind of stuff, um, will recommend to others, hey, look at when time comes, you might wanna call up the U Albany Archive because they are known for um, uh, capital punishment records. Mm -hmm. you, if you wanna research capital punishment, go to U Albany. There's all kinds of stuff that's coming from all parts of this country and beyond. And it's because um, archives get a reputation of, be, of being the place, not to dump, but to um, deposit these vital records. Because um, like I say, they, they, be, they develop a, a reputation of being a place where that has an interest in this area. And it might happen organically, like I said, one, one um, collection ends up at U Albany, And then next thing you know, someone else who's interested in that same area has a great collection and it's time for them to give it up and say, you know what, UMass has got collection A, they might as well have collection B. Before mm -hmm. long, they've got all the letters of the alphabet um, at, at, at UMass. If you want to know a lot about graveyards and mortuary, uh, um, you know, gravestones and, and cemetery records, and there's all kinds of stuff there. I'm not interested in that stuff. I am interested in social justice issues, and that's why um, Rob Cox um, did the right thing. Rob Cox went out and got the, those records on Lucy, and there are other movement records there. Rob Cox got Daniel Ellsberg's records. 
okay, um, at UMass. Wow. Um, and I, I bring Rob Cox up because I talked to him um, for, the, for my research. Um, why'd you go get that record? What was it like? You saw Lucy, what was she like? Um, and Rob Cox did not make it through COVID. Um, a lot of people I interviewed um, in January of one year were not around anymore in, in May of the, of the year. Um, he had a, um, a non-COVID related uh, death. Um, and it, 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 it's, but, but that's one of the things that I also wanted to uh, emphasize. Um, and this is something, I, I worked with Ronald Bosco, an English professor at the University at Albany, uh, who helped me greatly with this project. He's a biographer in his own right and an uh, archive researcher extraordinaire. Um, he um, said to me, you know, because I was telling him about this, this work, this, this idea that I had, <coughs> and excuse me, and he said, you know, you should get on that immediately. You should start talking to these people who are her contemporaries immediately. And that was great advice because um, a lot of voices um, who, a lot of the 130 people I contacted um, are not here to read the book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and a lot of people I would have liked to have talked to were not available for me to interview. Um, so I'm not known for procrastination, um, <laughs> but my advice would be, if you're gonna be writing about someone who's not decades dead, not centuries dead, but someone who's recently deceased, um, get on it, um, get on the phone. Um, I, I, I had to use other public repositories in order to find the people I wanted to find, uh -huh. um, including the Freedom of Information Law, um, the Freedom of Information Act, actually, because I want to get I wanted to get the FBI records of the pers of the entity that Lucy targeted, the, the rehab chain, I, I, and I got the records, a very thick box of records. I also asked for the FBI file of Lucy Gwynn, because she was an agitator, she was a poker, right. a prodder. Um, an organizer. She, um, in her magazine, uh, criticized the, de the Department of Justice and other state and federal agencies. Um, I thought maybe they might have set their sights on her at one point, started a file on her. Did she um, have an FBI file? Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> well, and by the way, once someone dies, their FBI records are available to you, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So she was deceased. I had, a, I had to prove that she was deceased. I had to send in her uh, obituary and uh, ask for her file. All I know is, I don't know if there's a file. All I know is the FBI says that they don't have anything to show me. They don't have anything to produce, but they did produce the, the New Medico uh, uh, investigation file and it was thick and it was redacted. The names of complainants were redacted. Uh -huh. um, however, this is another thing I, I tell my students, there's nothing venturing, nothing gained. Um, in those records, and I printed them out, uh, you get them digital, I got them digitally, I printed them out, there's probably an inch of records, maybe an inch and a half, both sides. Uh, there were two words in that inch and a half of documents that were absolutely vital to my research and to my story or to Lucy's story. Because in those records was a printout. This is an FBI file of an investigation of a business. Uh -huh. And there was a printout of a clip from a, from a uh, publication, which was uh, a watchdog publication over the healthcare industry. And it was a story about a woman who broke out of a Cortland, New York rehab facility. <laughs> and her name was Lucy Gwynn. <laughs> and it named the boyfriend. It quoted the boyfriend who broke her out. I was looking for that man's name everywhere. 
I was trying to find his name. I was calling some of her friends who were some, you know, trying to figure out who it was. Um, first and last name. And, you know, you the FBI. The they helped you out. There, you go to the Rochester phone book and you know what? It's 2018, 2019, maybe I got him. I can't remember. It's 2018, I think. Uh, and he was still living in Rochester after all these years. I called him up cold. He was one of the guys I called up cold and he told me the whole thing and it, was, it, it rang true. And it was important to hear that from him because one of the things that you uh, realize as a reporter, and one of the things I tell my journalism students is, you know, people say all kinds of things. Um, memories are shaky. Uh, people lie. They um, forget. They are almost right. Um, they deceive. Uh, so when he told me the story and it jibed with what Lucy had been telling people and writing about, it made me think that maybe she was a reliable narrator. And uh, that's important because if I was gonna go on this journey with her uh, and find out who she was, I wanted to see if I could, how much I could believe her story uh, and, how, and how much she, I could believe what she said. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who write memoirs and memoirs are written from the perspective of the person writing the memoir, right? Mm -hmm. They get to put in what they want. They get to write their own history. Um, biographers have a greater responsibility. Um, they, they have to try to write the stuff, write the story that the memoirist probably won't write. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I was keeping that in mind. Uh, and when I got those two words, a first and last name, it was worth the effort of going through the Freedom of Information Act to get that FBI file, believe me. And I also went to other public depositories. I went to other libraries, of course, and uh, looked at um, microfilm. Um, I wanted to find out what kind of day it was, you know, whether it was rainy or not, what was happening in Rochester on the day that she got into her accident. Um, I went to uh, records to find out uh, her, her family history, her birth records, um, her, her sister's birth records, her sister's death records. Um, I went to public repositories and I found, you know, court records. I found um, filings of, for instance, her DBA when she opened up uh, her restaurant in Rochester. Um, and uh, one of the things I learned, and by the way, why don't you go to the next, uh, next clip? Okay, I used um, the Indiana State Library uh, had her marriage information. It was very important. I wanted to know, I, heard, I thought that she got married in, uh, in 1960, right after she got out of high school. There's the marriage record. Now, if you go to ancestry.com, can you go to the next one? Okay, marriage record, different name. They misspelled the name of her first husband, right? And, uh, and, and I found out if you want marriage records, you go to India, Indiana State University, collects marriage records. Keep going, please. Um, this is her, this is Lucy, the, the blonde. This is what she looked like when she graduated from high school. Um, you can see next to her name, almost nothing. All these other students, very active, right? She was, a, as a freshman, she was on the Latin club uh, and she, she was on the cheer block in year two and then nothing. What was she doing? She was obviously interested in words if she was on the Latin club. Mm -hmm. She wanted to be a joiner when she was on the cheer block and cheering the basketball games. And then nothing. And I find out that when she was 17 years old, she got pregnant. And when she graduated from college, uh, excuse me, when she graduated from high school, she was 
pregnant with her first child. Um, and it was nice to see her, what she looked like when she was a young woman. Mm -hmm. And you look at that woman, right? And there's, uh, you know, it's a woman who seems to be looking off into the distance as if her destiny is somewhere beyond that page. Uh, keep going, please. Okay, this is uh, from the Rochester newspapers, the Democrat and Chronicle chronicled, a t she got back into the ad business um, in Rochester. And this is her ad team. That's her sitting down. Uh, this is shortly before her accident <coughs> that changed her life. Um, and the public repositories, newspapers, keep going, please. Okay, uh, this is a, a Zoom, zoom through this quickly, but this is the Illinois. Uh, one of the things that I learned, and I'm always learning things. I mean, I've been a reporter for a long time. Can we go to the next record? But this, this Illinois record, before, uh, before I forget, uh, in New York State, you can't get divorce records. In Indiana, you can't get divorce records. In a lot of states, you can't get divorce records. It dawned on me. That maybe she got, because I know that her first husband was working in Illinois. Um, and I said, maybe, you know, it's worth a shot. I call up the Illinois clerk's office. And I said, do you have any records, marriage or divorce records involving a woman named Lucy Gwynn? Again, it's under the heading of nothing ventured, nothing gained. And uh, the clerk says, yeah, just a minute. And I have a file here. She starts reading the, di the divorce decree to me. I said, is that something I can get my hands on? <laughs> and she said, what's your credit card number? And 15 minutes and $15 later, I had her um, divorce records. Um, I learned late in the game that you can get records in some states, I did, including Illinois. Um, okay, so this is this is another early record, Tom. Um, from newspapers.com is worth uh, getting a um, a subscription to. You can get free ones for, for a week. Um, but I went on a per perusal uh, of newspaper.com newspapers.com for Indiana and Kentucky records because uh, Lucy's people were from Louisville area and they moved to Indianapolis. The Indianapolis Star had some great pictures of Lucy when she was a little girl and a young woman and often with animals. She loved animals and that was a big part, that's a big part of the story. Um, this is her when she was a teenager. Um, and one of the things I learned about her father is she, he was in the ad business. He had a big personality. Um, and he wrote letters to the editor. Um, he um, influenced, I suspect, his daughter. Okay. Anything else? Uh, next one, please. Sure. Yeah. Whoops. Okay. One of the things I learned is that uh, Lucy's, and this is a Louisville Courier, Lucy's uh, was the, one of three daughters of her mother and father. Her oldest sister died in 1939 uh, after just being born alive for a, a short period of time. And this is part of the story um, because, you know, I, I wanted to find out how Lucy became Lucy. And um, it's important to understand somebody's roots. Uh, Lucy was born in 1943. Her sister, she had an older sister who didn't make it. And she had an, a younger sister who, were be, who was her, her best friend, mm -hmm. who's also uh, figures into the story quite a bit too. Um, and uh, newspaper records helped me greatly. 
Um, newspaper records are available in some cases through uh, university libraries and public libraries in microfilm. And some of these public uh, entities have newspaper.com subscriptions. Um, they're helpful. Okay. Yeah, we probably should get through the next couple because we got a couple of questions and I want to leave enough, have a little bit of time. Um, yeah. Yeah, you go right ahead. Well, this, this is, is this is another scene. This is her sister's um, suicide. Um, her younger sister, her yeah. best friend. Yes. So these things are available. A private collection. I told you I went to Washington, Pennsylvania, and picked up some very important stuff, yep. including her Merchant Marine ID. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, anything else? Uh, is, there's got to be at least one more thing. This one. Yep. Early image from a private collection. That's Lucy growing up with her sister in the middle, a mm -hmm. boy who lived, uh, who was the uh, son of uh, one of her mother's best friends. And he figures into one of her essays. Um, and these people, all three of these people are uh, uh, figured into the story. Um, okay. And then here's and, you. And that's me. Um, and that's just something there because I believe in research and uh, I don't have many good pictures of myself. Um, and, <laughs> but I love this one because of Einstein's uh, comments in the back background. If we knew what it was we were doing, it would not be called research, would it? And the reason I say that, the reason I like that is because a lot of people um, start off it, uh, thinking, you know, uh, students in particular, you know, they have a end of the end of the uh, semester um, paper that's got to be done, and it's vague. You tell them, or you ask them, please come up with something. I can assign you something, but there are two kinds of assignments: assigned assignments that you are someone gives you an assignment you give yourself. Um, you have to come up with your own stories. Um, we don't know what it's gonna be, but uh, if, you, if you go on a search, you might find it. So uh, th that's how I, I, I wanted to conclude this particular talk. And that's why that's, that, that picture's up. You can get rid of it immediately. Um, okay, thank you. So yeah, anyway, yeah, well, we got a couple of questions in the Q and A when I want to want to get to. But just to remind everybody, um, uh, if uh, this brain has a mouth, um, is available now. Um, right now, you can get it on Amazon, um, and uh, but it hopefully will be available in some other places. Barnes and Noble will sell it to you. Um, so, Jim, this has been a fascinating conversation. Yeah, this brain had a mouth. It's also available through book bookstore.org. Uh, which Great. or book, bookshop.org, which uh, allows local books bookshops to to get the book and get get a piece of the action. Perfect. Um, okay, Josie, right. got a couple of questions I saw. Yes, we do have a few, um, and I I wanted to start out with kind of a one a meatier one. Um, somebody has asked if you see any tactics in today's movements for political and social change. That, ha that have been adopted or adapted from the disability rights movement? Oh, boy, that's, that's really a good question. Um, the, the disability rights movement um, has, uh, like a lot of movements, has got um, uh, different philosophies and different, um, it's embraced differently by different people. But there is an organization that's particularly active um, and has been for years called ADAPT. And that's an acronym for a word I don't wanna say right now because I need to have it spelled out in front of me. But um, ADAPT is a nationwide collection of uh, activists and they often have actions. They go to, uh, they call them actions. They're really demonstrations or protests and um, around an issue, around a, a something that's missing, something that's that's wrong from their perspective. And they, they usually have an annual uh, action in some city. 
Um, and then they also are frequently uh, found in, in, in Washington, DC. Um, and one of the things that they do to, and Lucy helped to, Lucy participated in some of their actions as well as covering them. That's the difference between um, advocacy journalism and mainstream journalism. Um, she did, she was okay with rooting in the press box. She, um, but anyway, these actions involved um, posters and uh, banners and blocking entrances to public bu buildings, um, maybe chaining yourself to doorways, um, getting noticed somehow, even if it, it was at the risk of arrest. There are uh, uh, adapt activists who have been arrested many, many times. And uh, you see with some of the protests that have been going on in recent years, this is a tried and true adapt method. And their, their idea was, and many of their leaders were of the ideas that you had to be radical. You had to get noticed. And the only way you were gonna get noticed is if um, you did something that might cause a, a disturbance. Um, so I don't know if the leaders of today's movements were students of what ADAPT was doing, um, but ADAPT had a had and still does have uh, a system. And it's pretty, it, it, they're pretty, um, efficient at it too. They're, they're effective. They have captains and leaders and um, you go here, we go there. They're, they're, they know what they're doing. Um, and I, I, as a matter of fact, one of the things that uh, Lucy did in, in um, Mouth Magazine was she chronicled ADAPT actions. She, she did stories about ADAPT leaders and she wrote one edition or two editions of, of, of Mouth Magazine were organizers' um, manuals. This is how you go about doing it. Um, she wanted people to do that kind of um, activism. She believed in that kind of activism. activism. She believed in radical um, change. Um, and so she, uh, she plotted it. But I, I hope that answers the question. That's the best I'm going to be able to do on that because I haven't. I'm not a real student of today's actions. I read what I read. I know they exist. I know who some of the people are behind them. I know what the issues are, um, but I don't know how they organize. I don't. I, I'm not real, real familiar with that. Well, hopefully, people will pick up your book and and be able to um, take take that thread and run with it and see if there are some some methods. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, we only really have time for one more question, but I think it's a, an important one. Um, and you, you had answered it in the chat, but I wanna make sure um, somebody asked, has Mouth, the, the magazine been digitized and made freely available? And if so, where could people find that? Yeah, it, there, it is a Kindle, it is a print. Um, I understand they're trying to make it uh, uh, an audio version of it. Um, now, there are people who are uh, vision impaired um, or reading impaired who would like access to this book. I've been trying to work on that with the Univ University of Massachusetts Press, which published a book. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, in terms of digitation or, or making a digital uh, uh, version, you know, um, I think it, I think it is available on. I think you can get a digital digital version. I, I yeah. do. I know that there are some. I'm not sure if there's a complete set, but you can. UMass Amherst has digitized some yeah. copies of of Mouth, and they're yeah. available on their on their library website. Yeah. In the Seguin papers. Yeah, I I um, yeah, I think I think it is available on digi digital um, format. Um, so yes. But you know, Lucy was concerned about Mouth Magazine being a, that everybody who wanted access to Mouth Magazine could get access to that Mouth Magazine. One of the things she did, which I thought was interesting, is she used uh, blind readers in Rochester, New York, um, to read 
and make tapes of Mouth Magazine. And she disseminated it uh, via tape. And there, there's a pretty big, um, or was a pretty big um, group of uh, people with vision impairments and people with uh, hearing impairments in the Rochester area. Rochester's got a lot of interesting, rich history that I've learned about as a result of this project. Um, so anyway, uh, I hope that answers the questions, Josie. Yes, it does. Thank you very, very much. Um, I do want to uh, just let people know that this has been posted also in the Q&A, but um, that Jim will be presenting at the Karen B. Johnson Community Library in Schenectady uh, on Monday at noon, Monday, December 13th that's at noon. And that's an in-person event, or you can access it um, via Zoom as well. And I also would like to mention that now would be a great time for all of you listening to subscribe to New York Archives Magazine, where you will find an article by Jim in our upcoming uh, winter issue, which should be out by the end of this month. And I would like to thank uh, Jim and Tom for this excellent presentation today. And thanks to all of our attendees for joining us. It's our privilege to make these events available to you and to keep New York State's history alive. If you're interested in the content we create and want more, please contact us at aptrust at nyse.gov to receive a free past issue of New York Archives Magazine, which I promise you will enjoy. Uh, please join us on January 18th at 1230 for our next New York Archives Magazine online speaker series entitled Exploring the People and Places that Make New York Great. Learn more from New York Genealogical and Biographical Society President Josh Taylor about utilizing different types of archives and how they can be woven together to tell a more complete story. And for more information about that program and our other upcoming programs, please visit our website, nysarchivestrust.org. And thanks again to everyone for joining us today and to Jim and to Tom. <laughs>